By 1805, the fires of revolution had been burning in France for 13 years. Wars against nations had been attempted by the monarchies of Europe, yet the revolution still endured. In 1804, buoyed on by new successes in Italy, the Republic was swept aside and replaced with an empire, with Napoleon Bonaparte its emperor. War would come once again to France, and once again, the revolution would go on the offensive. In December 1804, France was secured. The early wars of the coalitions had been beaten back, and a young artillery officer had led an offensive in northern Italy, damaging Austrian influence and forces in the region during the War of the First Coalition. Over the next few years, political manoeuvring by Napoleon had led to the establishment of the First Consulate, a dictatorship in all but name. Napoleon was now in control of France, but the power he had was tenuous due to a rigged plebiscite in January of 1800. Napoleon, in response, led forces into Italy once again and with the assistance of Massena, won yet more victories for the French and utterly reduced the power of the Austrians in the region. On his return, he was once again greeted as a hero. After ordering an attack through Bavaria to finally defeat the Austrians, peace once again swept over France and in 1802 the Treaty of Amiens was signed between France and Britain, ending the War of the Second Coalition and allowing Napoleon to secure his political position. During this peace, Louisiana was also sold to the United States, effectively doubling the size of the country and preventing Britain from striking into French holdings in future wars. Napoleon was not, however, a universally adored figure. He faced threats from both ends of the political spectrum, with monarchists on one side and Jacobins on the other. These threats and attempt on his life pushed Napoleon to an imperial model of government within France based on that of the Romans, and on December 2nd, 1804, he was crowned Emperor of France. In the year before this, Britain had broken the Treaty of Amiens by declaring war, and in 1805 Britain added Russia and Austria into this alliance. The Third Coalition was born. Prior to this, Napoleon had been preparing the invasion of Britain, with l'armée d'Angleterre stationed at boulogne sur mer Of course, the defeat at the Battle of Trafalgar put an end to this idea, yet before that, Napoleon knew he would need to face his continental enemies at first and turned his attention to the Rhine. During the Lalin fighting, l'armée d'Angleterre was developed into la Grande Armée. It was an impressive setup and it changed warfare massively. La crux of la Grande Armée was the independent corps. These corps were meant to act semi-independently, supported with about 24 to 30 pieces of artillery each, and they were expected to last a day in a strong defensive position without support. Supporting these corps were reserve squadrons of cavalry, numbering around 22,000, with cuirassiers, dragoons, and of course, horse artillery. By the time 1805 rolled around, Le Grand Armée had swelled to 350,000 men. As already mentioned, this growth in continental enemies pushed Napoleon from focusing on defeating the British to securing his European holdings. Therefore, on September 25th, Napoleon crossed the Rhine with 200,000 soldiers of Le Grand Armée to march towards the Austrians in the Ulm campaign. The Austrians had planned to hold the French off and contain them until Kutuzov arrived with his Russian army to level the odds for the Austrians. In the region, the Austrians only had 72,000 men, compared to that with 235 of the French, which included 25,000 Bavarians, who were loyal to the French Empire. General Mack, de facto commander of the Austrians, had planned to hold the wooded and mountainous areas within the Black Forest in southern Germany. He also believed that due to this being a major point of operations during the French Revolutionary Wars, they would become so again. Mack therefore assumed no action would be taken through central Germany and Ulm would be impregnable due to its positioning near the Beichlerberg's Heights. The Aulich Council, or Reichshofrat, the court council of the empire, decided it would be wiser to send soldiers into Italy to prevent an invasion from that front, a front that Napoleon had already defeated the Austrians twice. It is also key to remember that when saying Austria in regards to the early parts of the Napoleonic Wars, it was actually meant as the Holy Roman Empire. The Austrias were indeed the preeminent power within the HRE at this time, and in 1804, Emperor Francis II founded the Habsburg Austrian Empire, in attempts to secure imperial status for the Habsburg amongst the massive upheavals of the Napoleonic Wars. To finish the plans, the Austrians required that Tyrol in the Alps be secured to provide a link between the armies in Italy and southern Germany. The French, on the other hand, had different plans to what the Austrians were expecting. Napoleon went east from Boulogne and wanted to surround the forces of Mack if Mack kept marching towards the Black Forest as he was doing. 
To keep this illusion, Murat was ordered to use his cavalry force and screen near the Black Forest to fool the Austrians. To support this push by Napoleon, several other forces would be deployed across both the region and in Europe. In Italy, Massena would attack the Austrian army in the north, while in the south, saint would attack against Naples. Marshal Brune would also keep troops in Bologna to protect against a British invasion. Recon around Tyrol and the main river was conducted, and the French had accurate maps of the area. The French planned to move in two ways. The left would come down from Hanover, in the north of Germany, while the right and centre of Le Grand Armée would concentrate in the Middle Rhine at Mannheim and Strasbourg. This would allow Murat to hold the Austrians in place while Napoleon and Le Grand d'Armée would swing towards the southeast, aiming for the city of Augsburg, and attempt to cut off the Austrian forces. The Austrians held a line along the river Ilia, around Ulm. Meanwhile, the French pushed hard to surround him. Mack was rather foolish. He did not expect the French to violate neutral Prussian territory, yet Bernadotte in Hanover had pushed right through Ansbach, a region controlled by the Prussians. Even with this news, Mack did not pull back putting faith in the strength of Ulm and its defences. Napoleon was also aware of another Austrian force based at Ingolstadt and ordered some of his forces to attempt yet another encirclement. Michel Ney was ordered along with Lens and Soule, all marshals in La Grande d'Armée and in command of a corps each, to cross the Danube. This encirclement failed and the Austrians in Ingolstadt pulled back. On the 6th of October, the commanders headed to Donauwerth and sealed off Mack's escape in Ulm. Quickly, Mack realised the danger he was in and attempted to go on the offensive against the French. On the 8th, Mack ordered his forces to amass at Gunsberg in an attempt to break out and sever the lines of communications for the French. Napoleon at this point did not truly believe that Mack would do this, but he did understand the strategic importance of the bridges in the area. Thus, he commanded Michel Ney to attack Gunsberg and secure the bridges, unaware that the Austrian forces were heading in that same direction. Before this inevitable clash of forces, there was another one within the Elm campaign, this time at Vertigen. Mack ordered Franz Javier Offenberg to move around 5,000 men away from Gunsberg to the town of Vertigen to prepare for the main Austrian advance. Vertigen was still south of the Danube, yet it was to the east of Gunsberg towards the French forces. Therefore, Murat's cavalry were the first to meet the Austrians, and there are two conflicting accounts of what took place. There is an argument by Digby Smith that the cavalry of Murat surprised the Austrians and broke up their formation and caused the Austrians to surrender. Or Ermret argues that the Austrians formed a large square to defend against cavalry and when the French grenadiers moved up, they were defeated. Either way, the Austrian force was completely destroyed and the decision by Mack here goes to strengthen his lack of military awareness and it is unclear why he sent so few men into an isolated position. The defeat had shown Mack that he needed to cross the Danube, crossing at Gunsberg. Yet, Ney was under orders from the Chief of Staff Berthier to prepare for a direct attack on Ulm on the 9th of October. Ney then sent Marler's 3rd Division to capture Gunsberg bridges, and on the way, the division ran into Tyrolean Jaegers and captured 200 of them, along with two cannons. Austrians around Gunsberg receiving this news fortified their position, with three more infantry battalions and 20 new cannons. The French 3rd Division attempted several attacks to open up the Austrian positions, and while they were unsuccessful, the French finally secured the bridges when the 59th Division came up in support and crushed the Austrians' attempt to repair the bridges. At the same time, Ney ordered the 2nd Division to attack the bridges around Elschingen, and thus the crossing was secured and Mack returned to Ulm. To clear up the confusion that some may be having here, there are definitely clear differences between the sizes of corps, divisions and battalions. The largest of all these units were the corps. In La Grande Armée, there were seven in 1805. Within the corps, there were several divisions which were smaller command units, and within these were regiments such as the 84E. Finally, making up regiments were battalions of around 300 to 700 men. The highest official rank within La Grande Armée, le général de division, anything higher, such as commander of the corps, were only honorary command titles. The Austrians then returned to Ulm, beaten and lacking a will to fight. Mack took time thinking of what his next move would be, and in the meantime, Napoleon started to underestimate the forces at Ulm. On top of this, Kutuzov was moving closer to the region, and Napoleon began to face the Russians. Command of Ney's and Lorne's corps was given over to Murat, and Napoleon led the rest of Le Grand Armée to the east to prepare for the Russians. Within a day of the Austrians pulling back to Ulm, Ney made a significant push towards the city on the 11th of October. 
The plan he had was for the 2nd and 3rd Divisions to move along the right bank of the Danube, whereas the 1st Division, under the command of Pierre Dupont, was to take the city directly with support from dragoons. Leading the van of the 1st Division was the 32E Regiment, and they ran into four Austrian regiments towards the town of Wolfingen. The 32E then attempted several attacks, yet did not succeed with any of them. The Austrians hoped that the failure of this would allow the French to become encircled, and the Austrians attempted this small encirclement on their own, and attempted to capture the 1st Division. They flooded men into the battlefield, and if successful, they had been able to turn the tide on the defence of Ulm. Dupont, however, was no fool, and he could see what the Austrians were attempting to do. Dupont led a surprise attack on the town of Jungingen, which led to the capture of another thousand Austrian troops, and despite renewed attack from the Austrians, forcing the French back slightly, the damage was already done. Napoleon now knew that the majority of the Austrian forces were encircled, and thus he sent two corps over to the Ilia in support. The defeats and the reinforcements from Napoleon towards Ulm caused panic and confusion within the Austrian High Command. The clearest example of this was the stubbornness of Ferdinand the Archduke. No, not that one. And Mack. They sent out differing orders that ended up leading to Austrians marching backwards and forwards along the roads around Ulm. On October the 13th, Mack made the final decision to set up two columns in preparation for the breakout he needed, made up of four Austrian corps. Ney, on the same day, sent assistance to Dupont, who was still on the north side of the Danube, heading towards the town of Elschingen, where one of the Austrian columns were heading. On the 13th of October, the Austrian corps, under the command of Riesch, found that the Austrian 1st Division was fighting against French forces. The Austrians, feeling that they would be unable to defeat the French, broke off the attack. Riesch then ordered his troops to set up camp on the hill at Elschingen, and the French forces secured the south end of the river. On the morning of the 14th, Ney ordered his men to cross the river and attack the Austrian bridge guard. Elite French forces captured the bridge quickly and French sappers quickly went to work repairing the bridge. Riche, in response, sent over two battalions, but due to the bridge being repaired, the French forces soon grew in size and quickly overpowered the Austrians. The French soon went on the offensive and attempted to seize the hill that Elschenkin was built on, with bloody fighting at Bayonet Point with Ney personally leading a charge with the 6th Light Infantry Regiment to capture the abbey on top of the hill. After the French cavalry joined the battle, the Austrians were routed and Riche returned to Ulm. On the same day, Soule's 4th Corps attacked Memmingen to the south. After skirmishes that would result in less than 20 French casualties, von Uternese surrendered with over 4,500 Austrians. They were cut off from Commander Ulm, poorly supplied and as a result, low on morale. The ease of this victory was a telltale sign of the success of Ulm campaign so far. On the 14th, Murat, who had now been given command of the forces around the Ulm, joined Dupont's 1st Division to assist with pushing back an attack from Werner, another of the Austrian corps commanders. Murat led the force to attack Heidenheim, and by nightfall, two French corps were close to the Austrian camp just outside Ulm. Mack was finally and completely trapped in Ulm itself. To the south of the city lay the Imperial Guard, to the east the entire French army, and to the west France itself. Mack still wished to hold within Ulm due to its strong defensive position. However, the Archduke Ferdinand overruled him and ordered the cavalry to be sent from Ulm to Werneck, a total of 6,000 men. However, after the success at Heidenheim, Murat had kept up his pursuit of the Austrian forces, and thus only 11 squadrons made it to Werneck's forces. On the 19th, Wernick surrendered, with the harassment from Murat too much. This led to 8,000 men being handed over to the French as POWs. Murat did not stop there, pushed on to Neustadt and der Donau in the east and captured yet another 12,000 Austrians. In Ulm itself, events were quickly coming to a finality. On the 15th, after Murat's success in relieving Dupont and separating Wernick from Ulm, Machane pushed and captured the Austrian camp outside Ulm. And on the 16th, bombardment of the city began itself. On the 17th, a deal was signed that if no aid arrived by 25th, Mack would surrender. Yet news of the various defeats of the Austrians after this date, such as Heidenheim, led to Mack surrendering early. And on the 21st, in a grand spectacle with all the Grand Army present, Mack surrendered. And on the same day, off the coast of Spain, the French fleet was destroyed at Trafalgar. While causing major issues for the grand strategy of Napoleon, he was not too bothered by the defeat at Trafalgar, for he just successfully captured 60,000 Austrian troops 
while only losing 2,000 of his own. The Ulm campaign, as mentioned, was a major success for Napoleon and would go on to prove the use of Alftrak static or mission leg tactics, albeit in a greater scale than the German army would go on to use. The German army took a lot from the Ulm campaign, and another effect this had was that the Ulm campaign can be seen as the predecessor to the Schieflin plan in a way of surrounding enemy troops without committing to the strong points of the enemy. This is known as turning tactics, and Ulm was the creme de la creme of the turning tactics. The Austrians in the campaign lost 60,000 troops, which at most were POWs. The French, as I said, only lost 2,000. And despite this huge difference in initial starting troops, the success of the Ulm campaign meant that Austerlitz and the combined forces of Russia and Austria would face French forces in all their might, or not distracted by forces in the west, and with Vienna already controlled by the French. Well, after the perhaps longest video to edit I've ever done, don't know why this one seemed to take so long, but it did. I hope you enjoyed the new maps. I'd like to give massive thank you to firstly my girlfriend for helping me out with all the French pronunciation. Uh, as a French speaker, she got very angry with my initial recording of how I did it and thus decided to teach me how to pronounce certain words. Still probably got it wrong and she'll still hate me, but hey, thank you very much there. Also like to thank Keys, one of the supporters on Patreon. Um, for providing me with Men of War 2, so perhaps look for some more exciting footage from World War 2 coming up soon on this channel. And of course, like to thank the Patreons as well. If you guys wish to support History Through Games, you know you can head over to Patreon, but an easier way to do it would be like, share, and subscribe to videos. Thank you very much. I've been Lozy, and this has been the Ulm Campaign on History Through Games. <laughs>